Good morning, and welcome to Jaffrey Bible Church. Today, by the way, is June 14th, 2020. I'm saying good morning and welcome to Jaffrey Bible Church service here on the 14th. We're all so excited to have you tune in with us. My name is Paul Cottier, and I am one of the elders here at Jaffrey Bible Church. We're excited to be opening up the facility, and as most of you know, we're having two services, one at 8.30 and another at 11. We will be transitioning to JBC Live by the end of this month. We are excited about the updates coming our way, and we will keep you posted on those as they arrive. I might want to add right here that um, if you go online, info at jaffreybible.org, you can keep up with the, with the emails and the updates as to how to attend service at this time, and that will be very helpful for you. As we open in prayer today, we want to pray for Tim and Julian Needham with YWAM in Tokyo. Please pray for their language learning. They are, become, they are beginning to meet with their teams again and will hopefully begin meeting in outreach opportunities in the coming months. I might also add that their experience there in Tokyo was not a whole lot different than ours. Um, they had to be isolated in uh, distancing and all those things. So it's been difficult for them as you would imagine. But they're starting to open up a bit there as well. So praise God for that. Um, as we pray this morning, um, let's do that together. And let's do that right now for our time together in the service. Um, for where you are and for where we are, can, we can be one in the spirit. And so let's pray. Father, we do that. We pray for Tim and Julianne. And we thank you that they are missionaries doing your work there in Tokyo. And Father, as they have requested, help them to learn the language. They're working at it, Father. And they ask for your help and your grace and your mercy in the learning so they might be able to communicate better with those people. So, Father, we ask that that might be uh, granted to them. And we thank you, too, that uh, you would free up the meetings so that they can meet with the locals, uh, meet with each other. And, Father, the, I pray that they, as well as everybody else, is taking advantage of this Time of difference, if you will. Different opportunities, different chances of doing different things. Uh, not the, the things that we're used to, but opportunities, the opportunities that we should seize. And so, Father, I want to encourage those who are hearing and listening and watching this morning. Father, that I would challenge us uh, with the changes as we are coming out from the COVID-19 in a, form or a format or a fashion uh, we are certainly not where we were three weeks ago. We are meeting together, so praise God for that. Father, I would ask that we, your people, would not despair, would not travail, would not be fearsome, would not be fearful. Uh, Father, but that we might trust in you and rest in you. And as Jesus prayed, uh, may your will be done, Father. And may we follow in Jesus' steps the way he lived, to show your love and your character to the world that needed to see it. And we needed to see it. And others need to see it. So may we encourage one another in good works. And may we follow in step with the Holy Spirit this morning as he guides and leads us through worship. Father, that may this be a beautiful, wonderful time of thankfulness. This is truly the day that you have made for us. May we be glad and rejoice in it. And so, Father, may this be an outcry, an outpouring of thankfulness for revealing yourself to us so that we might be saved. And through that personal relationship provided for us by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Jaffrey Bible Church. Enjoy your time with us. We thank you that you're here. In Jesus' name, amen. Love I've ever found comes 
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. Yeah, I worship you, Lord. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who.
Good morning. Uh, Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 2. Hopefully you have a set of notes with you as we get started this morning. Uh, They were emailed out or uh, you can go to our website and download them from there as well. As we go into our time of prayer this morning, once again, love for you to pray for those people with you, your family, if you know, wherever you happen to be. And also would like for you to pray for those on the front lines dealing with COVID-19, as well as the issues within our divided country. The scriptures tell us righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So as we spend time in prayer this morning, let's pray for our country that righteousness would reign in our lands. Would you pray with me, please? Would you pray with me, please? Lord, speak to me. Amen. This morning, as we get started, we are starting a new subsection in Paul's argument, demonstrating that all people in their own righteousness stand condemned before a holy God. We in our own righteousness all fall short of God's righteousness, which has been revealed which is the theme of the book of Romans. After Paul's greetings, he deals with the issue of sin, demonstrating that God's righteousness is lacked by all people, by the Gentiles in chapter 1. As he presented this, you can picture moral people who are up on higher ground, looking down at the sins that Paul is describing in the lives of those people and thinking, I'm better off than those people are. But then Paul demonstrates that moral people stand condemned before God because they don't live up to their own morality. In fact, he tells us they end up storing up for themselves wrath. They're they're, they're storing it for themselves. We've looked at the last few weeks. Uh, Today, we will start looking as Paul deals specifically with religious people, with those who are Jews. Now, theologians are split down to the middle as to whether in verses 1 through 16, when Paul dealt with the moralist, he was dealing with Jews or he was dealing with Jews and God-fearing Gentiles. Regardless of which group he was dealing with there, because the interpretation really does not change, regardless of which group it is, it is very clear whom he's dealing with here. He's dealing with the Jews. He uses them because, first of all, he's Jewish, and he knows them pretty well. Secondly, they are the prime example of religious people within his culture. All of their lives revolve around who they are religiously, uh, they, they, they see themselves in light of that. They, they maintain the Sabbath, regardless of which nation they happen to be in. They, they kept the various festivals. They, they kept other duties that revolved in their lives as Jews. And so Paul is going to address that. And then in a few weeks, we're going to see that he's going to deal with all people in Romans 3, 9 through 20. Paul is painting a very dark, background. It's really disheartening to read all that. But as he does that, he is preparing us as he lays down the jewel of the gospel for us to see among this dark background. So as we're going to see, and as most of us already know, there's great privileges and great benefits to being a part of the people of God. But those privileges also have obligations. In 2002, in the movie Spider-Man, Peter Parker, who is played by uh, Tobey Maguire, is having a conversation with his Uncle Ben. And uh, the Uncle Ben was played by Cliff Robertson. 
And in that conversation, Uncle Ben tells him, with great power comes great responsibility. That phrase is repeated two other times in the movie to, to really emphasize that. You know, in the same way, with great privileges come great obligations. It's a privilege to have been a part of the Israelite nation. There are great blessings to being a Jew. As Paul will declare to us in chapters 3, verses 1-8, through 8, and he's going to share some of that with us here as well. But with those blessings come responsibilities. Unfortunately, the Jews took some of those responsibilities and obligations for granted. They relied on the fact that they were Israelites, and that was sufficient in their minds to have them right with God, regardless of how they behaved with their moral conduct, not only among themselves, but also among other people. Paul's going to make it very clear that religious people who simply trust their religion don't measure up to the righteousness of God. It's a righteousness which His righteousness demands that He demand, as the Puritans used to put it. So I want you to follow along with me as we look at Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. I'm going to read the text for us. It says, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law, and boast in God, and know His will, and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Now, if you have a set of notes with you, you're going to see that they're a little bit different from most of the notes that I hand out, because as you're going to see, for the most part, I've simply rewritten this text in the notes with a few headings, and we're just going to walk our way through it. I did that partly because this section in Romans is not very hard to understand for the most part. It's pretty straightforward. It's very understandable. Paul's going to begin by indicating that the Jews initially had a revelation from God in verse 17. That's something special, and that is an amazing blessing. He starts off, but if you bear the name Jew. It was an honor to bear that name. A Jew was initially a person from the tribe of Judah. And the word was first used in our Bible in 2 Kings 25.25. After the Babylonian captivity, as Judah was the largest of the tribes who were a part of the remnant, the, the term Jew began to be utilized of all the Israelites. And then even further on, as people became converts to Judaism, they were proselytes to Judaism, they also began to be called Jews. Other labels that they utilized as a people were Hebrews, or because which took them back to being the children of Abraham, and then obviously just the name Israelites when God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Each of these names were a privilege and they were a blessing. Being a Jew was to be honorable, and yet the people had dishonored that name and dishonored the God who had that name. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9, Jesus is talking to the church at Smyrna and He says the following. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. They had gone from being the people of God to being the synagogue of Satan. They had dishonored 
His name. Secondly, he says, if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law. That's another blessing, that they had the law from God. They had a revelation from God on whom they should be and how they should live. Unfortunately, they abused that. Like a child that brags to others if their father has given them a special gift that others didn't get from the dad. So the Jews simply bragged about the blessings that God had given to them without really living up to it within their own lives. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, we read the following. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. They weren't living up to the law that God had given to them. They were proud that they had it, but they didn't live up to what it taught them to do. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11, it says, In that day you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exultant ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. Now, as I read these verses, I think of how true that can be of us as the body of Christ. We can become proud that God has given us His Word, the Bible, and in many times it just kind of sits in a nice place in our home where it isn't touched and oftentimes not even lived out. May that never be true of any true follower of Jesus. May we... Praise God that He has given us His law, and may we learn to live by that truth. Thirdly, he says they boast in God. The Jews knew the living God, the one true God, as opposed to the idols of the lands in which they lived. Yet their boast in Him did not translate to obedience to Him. Now there's nothing wrong in boasting about God. We should do that. But how was that boast done? Are we boasting in Him? Or in reality, are we boasting in ourselves? Do we boast because we are proud? Or do we boast in God out of humility that God has been pleased to reveal Himself to us? In Psalm 34, verse 2, it says, My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Isaiah 66, 2 says, the latter part of the verse says, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. There's got to be a humility for that to happen. In Jeremiah 9, verses 23 through 26, many of us are familiar with 23 and 24. Listen to it with the other verses following. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised, Egypt 
and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab, all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair of their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. You know, they boasted in a God who was there and who was true. He was the true God. But they were not obeying Him in the way that they lived their lives. The knowledge of God should produce holiness, not haughtiness. It should not make us proud, but it should make us humble because that's who God is. The Jews were blessed because they had a revelation from God. In verse 18, we also see that they had the recognition of His will. It says, and know His will. The Jews had a game plan to follow. They're not going blind as they go through life. He revealed His will to them in His Word. He gave them commands to follow. He told them the consequences of obeying Him and the consequences of disobeying Him. They knew His will. James 4.17 tells us, though, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it. To him it is sin. They knew His will, but they didn't obey it. Next it says, they approve the things that are essential. Approve means to test something. It means to examine and show it to be genuine. Essential can also be translated excellent. These two words are used in the prayer that Paul prayed that's given in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. There Paul says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. And those approved things should be evident and they should be visible in the lives of those of us who claim to know God. How did they have all this as being instructed out of the law? The latter part of verse 18. The Jews were excellent at doing this. They taught their children well, and they taught them from a very early age. They instructed out of the law. Every Sabbath they heard the law being read and the law being expounded by someone in the synagogue. You know, some of the key verses in our Bible for Jews and us Christians also is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. The text says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Jesus said that the greatest commandment was the first part of this text, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But this text also tells us that we're to pass it on, and the Jews did that. And notice how they did it. They did it in their home and they did it on the way. They did it as they walked and they did it as they just moved around. They did it formally and informally. They were committed to teaching the truth of God. And that takes us to verses 19 and 20 in Romans 2, which talks about the rearing, the bringing up of those who are uninformed says, being confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. They, they, they were confident. You need to have confidence to be able to persuade others, and they were. These instructions viewed how the Jews were to pass on the truth of God to others who were unenlightened. And those who are unenlightened are the Gentiles. Every one of these Pictures here literally is of Gentiles from a Jewish perspective. 
being confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. They were to be a guide to the blind. And yet, unfortunately, Jesus called the Pharisees of his day blind guides leading blind. And then both of them would end up in the ditch. They were to be a light to those in darkness. And once again, unfortunately, Jesus said, if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? They weren't living up to who God called them to be. They're to be correctors of the foolish. Corrector has the idea of a coach or a trainer. It's one who disciplines in the process of teaching. It's a pedagogue, somebody who's bringing others up. That would be a parent also who's involved in doing this. And then a teacher of the immature. They could and should teach those who were younger than them and had less knowledge than them. You know, that's true of all of us as well. Unfortunately, confidence can quickly become conceit or arrogance, as it did in many times in the Jews' lives. And that can lead to contempt of others. You know, one writer said it's hard to be a missionary when you hate other people and look down on them. You know, it was hard for the Jews at times to carry the message of God to other peoples because they looked down on other peoples. And unfortunately, that's true of us in the church at times as well. It's really hard to be a missionary for Jesus when you look down on other people and have conceit within your own life the way that they did. You know, that's what happened to many in Israel, and they didn't pass what they possessed, which was a sure word from God having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. They had the knowledge of God. They had the truth of God. In one sense, you could say that they had a monopoly on God and revelation from Him. You know, but instead of being those who shared what they had with others, they hoarded it to themselves. They became proud of what they had and they ignored their responsibility to God and to other people. May that never be true of us as a local church or as the Church of Jesus Christ Universal, that we hoard this to ourselves without passing it on to others. You know, they had it, but it didn't have them. You know, having said all this, Paul now turns the tables just a bit and he begins to ask them some questions. He doesn't attack them, but he gives a series of questions that are designed to get them to think about their lack of obedience to God, their lack of concern for others. Look at the request from the Apostle Paul in verses 21 through 23. Verse 21 says, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You know, that's kind of a summary statement from the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's basically the overview of what he's saying to them. What follows, he goes from a summary to very specific things. Continue on. You who preach that one shall not steal... Do you steal? You know, we would call that being immoral if somebody stole, for theft is wrong. You know, unfortunately, we associate the word immorality a lot of times just with sexual sin. But, but anything that lacks morality, anything that falls short of the morality that God has set up for us is immoral. And so in asking this question about stealing, you who say that one shall not steal, do you steal? Paul is helping them to see that they're falling short of God's standard. You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You know, they were sensual in their lives. In Psalm chapter 50, verses 16 through 18, just listen to these verses. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you hate 
discipline and you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you associate with adulterers. You know, I I looked up and read that text and wondered in my mind if the Apostle Paul had that verse in mind when he penned what he said for us here. You know, Jesus told the Pharisees that they devoured widows' houses. They were thieves. It's said of many of those who were rabbis that they were notorious for being immoral sexually. They were sensual. Unfortunately, many a Christian pastor has been also. May God help us. We so desperately need Him. He continues on. Uh, You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You know, the Israelites learned a valuable lesson when they were carted off into captivity in Babylon. They spent 70 years there, and you really don't read a whole lot about them falling into idolatry when they came back from the captivity. But they still robbed God and His temples. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. You know, James Stifler, in his commentary, looking at these three questions, these three areas that Paul addresses, wrote the following. These verses show his sad failure in doing that will of God, referring to the Jews. Paul does not assert that the Jew was guilty of these three sins, of idolatry, of sensuality, and immorality. He put it significantly in the interrogative form. This means that his questions could have but one answer. In the first chapter, in dealing with the Gentile, he proceeds from idolatry to immorality. This order is reversed in the case before us. He proceeds from immorality to idolatry. This change in order is easily accounted for. When it comes to the Jew, he writes climactically. Idolatry was forbidden by the very first commandment. The Jews claimed to be free from it and professed to abhor it, to hate it. And yet Paul, more than intimate, excuse me, and yet Paul more than intimates that he is guilty of this foolish, debasing crime, the worst of all sins. He mentions it last because it is the blackest. You know, in listing these sins, Paul showed that in reality, they're not much different than the Gentiles who did not know God. Romans chapter 1, verses 32 ended with this verse. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. In reality, there's not much difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, between any of us as people. We all desperately need God, a God that both Gentiles and Jews alike have dishonored. If you look at the last phrase of that section, he says, uh, You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Verse 23, you who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? They did dishonor God. Let me give one last point here. Paul not only gives this as a summary at the beginning of this section and then gives singular questions for them to think about in specific commands, Uh, excuse me, uh, specifics, he gives really a singular thought here. The word you, beginning in verse 17, where this section begins, 
all the way down to here. Every time you see a you in there, it is individual in the Greek language. He is talking to individual Jews to examine their individual lives. He's singular in that aspect of it. He wants each of his hearers to examine his or her own heart. Just as God wants each and every one of us individually to examine our own heart as we hear this. Now we come to the result of this hypocrisy. That's the only word you can really refer to it as. Verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. You know, there's many places where one can trace this Old Testament quotation. You know, if you've got a study Bible and it has cross-reference in, more than likely you're going to see Isaiah 52.5 and Ezekiel 36.20 and then the letters FF, meaning the verses that follow. Isaiah 52 verse 5 says, Now therefore, what do I have here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause? Again, the Lord declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. And then this amazing text in Ezekiel 36. I'm going to start in verse 16 and read through verse 23. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land because they had defiled it with their idols. Also I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have not come out of his, hand, his land. But I have concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. That's an amazing, powerful text about God's holy name and His gracious actions on behalf of people as He proves Himself holy. You know, there's one other text I want you to think about. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we have the story of King David and his sin with Bathsheba. In 2 Samuel 12, David is confronted by Nathan the prophet. And Nathan uses a word picture to capture the king's heart. But in the process of doing that, he says the following in verse 14. However, because by this deed you, referring to King David, have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You know, whenever we as Christians are caught in sin, it gives people who don't know the Lord ammunition to blaspheme His holy name because of what they see in our lives. You know, as we conclude, I want us to think about the Jews of Paul's day and the Christians of today. You know, as followers of Jesus, you and I need to be wise. 
Wisdom is always learned by experience. And the best of wisdom is learned by somebody else's experience. As Christians, let's learn from the Jews who've gone before us and not give the enemies of the Lord an opportunity to blaspheme His holy name. You know, in many parts of the world, when they think of the Christian West, as they refer to us, they think of hedonism, they think of immorality, they think of drug abuse, they think of racial tension. They think of so many things that should not be a part of the body of Christ. You know, let's be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. If we bear the name Christian and we rely upon God's Word, let's live lives that are worthy of the God who has drawn us to Himself, who so loved us that He sent His Son to die on a cross for us. This morning as we close in prayer, if you've never trusted Jesus, why not do that as we pray? If you have trusted Christ, would you allow the Spirit of God to examine your heart in light of this text? To see if there be any wicked way in you, any wicked way in me as I examine my own heart, and that God would lead us in the way everlasting, that we would not have His name being profaned by what people see in our lives. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you uh, for this passage of Scripture. It is a challenging passage of Scripture that is so simple to walk through, but, but is so convicting to walk through because it challenges us to live out the truth of we, who we are to be in you. And I pray, Lord, that you would take your word and that you would apply it to our lives and apply it to our hearts God, that you would help us to be a people who are obedient to what you have revealed to us. Ultimately, so that your name would not be profaned among the nations because of us. And Father, for anybody who is watching today, listening, who does not have a personal relationship with Christ, I pray, Father, that you would help them to see that heaven is not gained through effort. Heaven is not won by the strongest or the swiftest. Heaven is freely given. Eternal life is freely given to those who will humble themselves, admit and confess their sin, come to God in brokenness and in humility, and come to the foot of the cross and trust Christ and nothing else. Lord, if there's anybody hearing my voice right now who does not know you, would you be pleased to touch their lives and their hearts, open their eyes to respond to your truth and draw them to yourself. And Lord, having trusted you, help them to grow in your grace and in your knowledge, which I pray for each and every one of us who already know you. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
praise and glory. I want to thank you for uh, watching the service today. Uh, pray that you would have just a great, wonderful week walking with the Lord, being obedient to what God has revealed to you in His Word. If you have any questions, any comments, uh, if you need anything from us, please contact us at the email that you'll see on your screen, info at jaffreybible.org. Thank you and have a blessed day.